this is All About Bitcoin, a show dedicated to all things, questions, and markets related to Bitcoin, little b for the currency and Bitcoin, big B for the network. A collective journey to understand, apply, and use this innovation, all Bitcoin, all the time. Let's have a live look at the Bitcoin Coinesk ETX price index right now at $47,668. Bitcoin is in retreat about 5.4% over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news, events, and data. The chart of the day is brought to you by Crypto.com, the world's fastest growing crypto app. All eyes are on Bitcoin dominance nearing a record low. You see there here we see Bitcoin dominance decline toward its lowest level since June of 2018 in blue and Ethereum dominance gaining in yellow. Analysts pointing to several factors to explain the upward trajectory, one of them being Ethereum blockchains. EIP-1559 upgrade implemented in August. That change has effectively reduced the net new supply of Ether from the Ethereum blockchain, and it appears to help ETH make gains in a risk-off environment. Meanwhile, Bitcoin retreating further away from the $50,000 mark, BTC looking weak a day after CEOs from six major crypto firms spoke before the U.S. House of Representatives Financial Services Committee. Bitcoin and Ethereum saw significant bids being stacked up following the hearing. However, this has and slow down, according to crypto fund manager Stack Funds. Joining me now to discuss Bitcoin and more is Jeff Dorman, Chief Investment Officer at Crypto Asset Manager Arca. Hello there, Jeff. So why are we seeing this sell-off in Bitcoin? What, what do you think is driving it lower? <laughs> well, as, as we always say when we come on your show, you know, Bitcoin is a long-tail call option, and the day-to-day -day moves are very difficult to assess. Um, we jump around a lot in terms of drivers and correlations. Um, over the last four weeks, just about everybody who trades Bitcoin has become a macro trader, right? Most people didn't care about the month over month CPI prints uh, until last month when it was at 6.2%. And now everybody cares a lot about the CPI prints. Um, you know, similarly, Omicron came about, everyone got very uh, worried about what Omicron would mean in terms of, uh, 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 you know, future lockdowns or, or, or declining GDP. Um, what's interesting to me, though, is that over the last four weeks, basically since uh, uh, November, right, right before Thanksgiving, um, just about every other risk asset has now completely retraced all of the sell-off from the last four weeks. Um, the credit markets are back to all-time highs. The uh, equity markets are basically back to all-time highs. The VIX has completely retraced the volatility index. Um, you know, Really, the only difference in the market today versus four weeks ago outside of digital assets is the shape of the yield curve, which has flattened a lot. The two-year treasury uh, yield is higher, the 10 and 30 year treasury yield is lower. Everything else is completely retraced as if Omicron and the CPI print didn't even happen. So it's only digital assets that are struggling. And if that's true, uh, that we are just tracking macro right now, well, tomorrow's a big day. Tomorrow's the CPI number. If that comes in anywhere uh, close to um, consensus or lower, I think you're going to see a big move in Bitcoin. I think you're going to see a big move higher in basically all risk assets because it shows that this you know, uh, higher levels of inflation are starting to uh, uh, subside. Uh, and that should be a boon to Bitcoin. As far as what's happening today, you know, day to day fluctuations are hard to tell. It's interesting you mentioned that that risk assets are back to pre Omicron inflation levels, except digital assets. Why do you think that is? Is it because that they're not correlated? Or what, what do you see as a reasoning behind Bitcoin lagging? I think we always know that long term, the correlations are not that high. But over the last 12 months, Bitcoin specifically has had a much higher correlation to equity markets and to rates than every other digital asset, which makes sense because Bitcoin is, in fact, a macro asset, right? It's a, it's a long term option on uh, purchasing power and store of value, whereas other digital assets are really more like quasi equity into uh, uh, the growth of networks or uh, the growth of companies like whether it's DeFi or sports or NFTs or gaming, um, there's really no reason why other digital assets would have higher correlation, but Bitcoin naturally does. Um, so I think, you know, longer term, most correlations are still very low. Shorter term, in the last six to 12 months, it's been very high and it probably will continue to be very high. Um, and I think that, like I said, if, if Bitcoin is going to be a leading indicator, then that would suggest that equities are probably, that this is a little bit of a dead cat bounce and equities will probably come back down. If Bitcoin is being a lagging indicator, well, it's lagged quite a bit relative to the balance of other uh, risk assets. So again, I think the CPI print tomorrow and the Fed discussions next week 
uh, if we see a, a, a less than uh, 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 scary CPI print, and if we see a little bit less hawkish Fed, um, I think it'd be very hard for us not to see Bitcoin rally into the year end. And, and we've seen this the last three years. If you look at the chart of Bitcoin over the last three years, um, the first uh, week and a half has been low. Um, we've seen declines from December 1st to anywhere between December 9th and December 17th. But the last few weeks of every year, the last three years, you've seen a huge move higher in Bitcoin. And I would expect the same thing to happen, especially if these macro conditions continue to subside. I want to pivot toward the congressional hearings on crypto that took place yesterday. And I preface this by uh, saying you've teased your predictions for the digital asset market in 2022. So I want to get your thoughts on those hearings. Uh, and in the first page of your predictions, you do mention that regulation will be slow. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's inevitable that regulation, especially here in the United States, will continue to be very slow. Um, I thought the the, the testimonies yesterday in the, in the hearings, it was the first time we've really seen a forum like that be pretty balanced, right? It wasn't bipartisan at all. There was no you know Democrat versus Republican uh, issues. It was really um, pretty calm. It was pretty uh, even keeled. It was pretty balanced, with the exception of a of a few like uh, uh, like Sherman, who who obviously has very uh, uh, draconian views on this space. But for the most part, um, it was pretty balanced and it was healthy. And it was encouraging to see this stop being a um, attack on the digital asset industry for what it is not, and instead being more of an educational journey to how do we continue to foster growth across digital assets? How do we find different pockets of the digital asset ecosystem that are beneficial to many parties here in the United States and abroad? Um, and I think it was uh, as positive of an outcome as you could expect from a, from a setting like that. In terms of what will actually get done, however, it's a mixed bag. I think stablecoin regulation is absolutely first priority. I think that's the one that makes the most sense. I think that's the easiest to implement with, uh, um, in terms of operating within existing laws and frameworks. I think everything else is a multi-year process. You need new laws. You need new frameworks before you're going to be able to push any sort of real regulation um, across other aspects of this industry. also want to get your outlook on Bitcoin in terms of 2022 predictions? Where where do you see Bitcoin uh, in terms of price predictions? Uh, I don't make price predictions, but I will tell you that I saw your Bitcoin dominance chart before I came on, and I think that's the easiest call of anything. Bitcoin dominance will continue to go lower. It will likely never go higher ever again. Uh, it's a flawed metric to begin with. It makes no sense. Um, you know, By definition, as if a market is evolving, and you're going to have new issuers come to market. You're going to have new sectors, new issuer types. Uh, by definition, Bitcoin's share of the overall digital asset market will go down, and that doesn't mean Bitcoin can't become a ten trillion dollar asset. It very well may, be, you know, it very well may go up a uh, you know a thousand x, or sorry, a thousand percent or ten x from here. Uh, but it's going to continue to lose market share to mm -hmm. the rest of the digital asset industry. Yes, and to that. And I know you're very active in decentralized finance, particularly SushiSwap. They're having a bit of a crisis. Their, their leadership team is falling apart. But this is a Bitcoin show and there are uh, Bitcoin DeFi projects out there. So I, I wonder, more generally speaking, are the problems you're encountering at SushiSwap characteristic for DeFi projects or specific to this case? It's it's specific to DAOs in general. Um, decentralized autonomous organizations are experimental. Um, you know, most people talk about decentralized versus centralized as being black and white. Uh, we don't see it that way. We see it along a spectrum. Um, fully centralized is rarely the best option because uh, you have too much of a, a single point of failure and a single point of control. Um, fully decentralized becomes you know outright chaos because nothing ever gets done and there's no leadership. What you want to do is work along that path where you have a few centralized best practices in terms of leadership, in terms of guidance, but you ultimately lean towards decentralization with regard to ownership of the tokens, ownership of the DAO, who gets to vote on, on big key decisions with regard to uh, how money and, and, and resources are spent. Uh, and I think SushiSwap is going to be a Harvard Business School case study for years uh, with regard to how to fix that. Um, from my standpoint as an investor, you know, this is the dream distressed scenario. Uh, it's very hard to find a company that has the kind of product market fit, uh, the kind of traction, the products, the user base, the community that Sushi has. What they have is a leadership crisis. That's the easiest thing to fix. I mean, that's that's activist investing 101. As you come in, you blow up leadership and management, you put a new structure in place, and all of a sudden you hit go and, and everything's working perfectly. What you can't do is fake 
the kind of success and growth that this project has had. So, um, you know, again, not specific to sushi, specific to all DAOs. Uh, it's challenging, and it's about putting in proper structures and, and, and straddling that line between decentralization and centralization. All right, Jeff. Thanks for your insights. Appreciate you coming on the show. That was Jeff Dorman at ARCA. Coming up, more Bitcoin news and analysis with crypto infrastructure provider Prime Trust. Welcome back. Let's take a look at some of our top stories. The Bitcoin hash rate, a measure of computing power on the network, almost completely recovering to its level in May when Chinese authorities started cracking down on the industry. At the time, China was the biggest Bitcoin miner in the world, accounting for 71% of the global hash rate, according to the University of Cambridge. Since then, the hash rate has been increasing steadily as miners set up operations overseas. As the hash rate increases, the difficulty of mining a Bitcoin block also increases. An OKLink researcher expects the difficulty in to increase this weekend by 4%. Arcane research forecasts a 7% increase and predicts the hash rate will hit an all-time high before the new year. Meanwhile, MicroStrategy purchasing an additional 1434 bitcoins for over $80 million in cash, an average price of about $57,500 per bitcoin. As of today, CEO Michael Saylor is saying the business intelligence firm that's taken to accumulating bitcoin holds over 122,000 bitcoins acquired for over $3.6 billion, at an average price of just under $30,000 per bitcoin. The company raised funds for the purchase by selling shares. Finally, crypto exchange Coinbase is planning to integrate Ledger hardware wallets, bringing users more options for self-custody of their crypto. The integration will be rolled out in phases in the first quarter of 2022, beginning with a Ledger to Coinbase wallet browser extension. Separately, Ledger is launching a crypto debit card called CryptoLife. Card users will be able to use paying crypto to more than 50 million retailers and online stores. The card will be available to customers in the UK, France, and Germany in the first quarter of next year and in the United States to customers in the second quarter. Joining us now to discuss Bitcoin news and more is Rodrigo Vicuna, Chief Financial Officer at crypto infrastructure firm Prime Trust. Hello there, Rodrigo. Thanks for coming on the show. So, you know, just off the bat, we're seeing a sell-off in Bitcoin. Would love to hear your thoughts on why we're seeing this retreat. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Christine. Um, I think the sell-off really has to relate to the fact that you know we're having, um, despite the fact that hash rates are increasing, miners have to cover their their prior costs. That transition or transitory period from them moving from China to different regions, et cetera, that comes at a cost, and so you have some level of minor capitulation, et cetera. Um, the best kind of one of the best indicators that I kind of look at for that is uh, hash rates and hash ribbons in general, similar to what you were mentioning before. And I think what happens is you have the miners who have inventory selling off, covering their costs. People get a little bit of spooked um, from a spooked position, similar to what Jeff mentioned earlier. This week is always kind of a lower week, but the Santa rally is probably right around the corner. And I think 2022 is going to be a bigger year. Right. So at uh, Prime Trust, you had a prediction of $100,000 per Bitcoin uh, prediction by the end of the year. That didn't pan out. I wonder why not. And you mentioned that you still have hope for a big Santa Claus rally. I still believe that there will be a Santa Claus rally. Whether or not it's $100,000, I can't speculate on that one. Um, but I think if we cross over that threshold of around the $70,000, $75,000 mark, that definitely gives me a lot more confidence to say that the 100K mark is right around the corner. All right. Looking at MicroStrategy, they're buying up more Bitcoin. And generally speaking, is that a trend you're seeing among corporates putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet? Definitely. Um, at Prime Trust, we're one of the largest infrastructure providers in the space. And as a result of that, 
we're able to work with incredibly large institutions and major blue chip players within the overall crypto space as well. And so we do get that direct look into the market and into whether larger FIs are ultimately buying. And I can tell you with certainty that, that is happening um, from, from banks down to traditional fintechs, et cetera. This is something that people want to add to their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. In providing crypto infrastructure, are you also talking to governments about providing those services? We see that in the United States with the congressional hearings being held on crypto. You know, they're looking at crypto and exploring ways uh, that they could uh, incorporate it and potentially create a digital dollar. And El Salvador, of course, is also looking to build out their crypto infrastructure. Definitely. On the El Salvador point, um, actually, Prime Trust is the underlying back end to El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin. And we work with um, a key client to get that to get that done. Um, I think CBDCs or central bank digital currencies are a core part of the future payments market, remittance market. Um, you know, at any one point in time, we can have trillions of dollars locked up. And that was a core point that was made by um, one of the CEOs uh, in front of Congress yesterday. Crypto is a core way of being able to solve that problem. And I think infrastructure players such as Prime Trust are in a really, really good position to take advantage of that. But moreover, looking at the space as a whole, um, it, it, it leads to an overall view of adoption. As crypto becomes native to what everyone is talking about, and it's native to their typical buying experience, it's native to their wallet, uh, it's a core part of what regulation should ultimately then adopt too, because I think the market will outgrow regulation unless uh, unless some clarity is provided. All right. Well, Rodrigo, thanks for joining us. If governments need some crypto infrastructure to be built, they know who to call. That was Prime Trust CFO Rodrigo Vicuna. That's it for All About Bitcoin. I'm your host, Christine Lee. We'll do it all over again tomorrow at 3 p.m. in New York. Also join us at 9 a.m. in New York for First Mover. You're watching Coindesk TV.